through John this morning, uh, and that by your spirit, uh, you would change our hearts to love and serve you all the more. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Johnny. Well, morning, everybody. Oh, thank you very much, John. Uh, if you don't already know me, my name's John. I'm one of the leaders here, uh, and we're going to spend the next little while digging into that passage. Uh, but maybe you already know the story. Uh, it's incredibly famous, isn't it? The crowds come to the man of God, uh, and he takes just a few barley loaves and miraculously feeds all of the people. Uh, of course, it's that famous story from 2 Kings chapter 4 when Elisha feeds a crowd of 100 people. Do you all know it? Maybe not. Uh, maybe not one of the most famous passages. Uh, and yet, here in John's Gospel, we get clear echoes of that, of God's prophet miraculously providing from just a few loaves of barley for crowds of people. Uh, but, but actually, this is far better known, isn't it? Because uh, here we see the man of God with crowds of thousands of people who have come to listen to him on the side of a mountain. Uh, and he divides them into smaller groups and then he provides miracle bread from heaven. Clearly, this is all about Moses on the mountainside thousands of years before, after he, he gives them the law and gives the Israelites the law and feeds them manna from heaven while they spend 40 years in the wilderness. Uh, maybe you don't know that, that Bible passage or that section of, of the Bible from the book of Exodus. But you see, as we see Jesus feed this crowd here in John 6, we're being given very clear echoes of both of those passages from thousands of years before. Moses, God's greatest prophet. And yet Jesus is greater than Moses. E Elisha, another significant prophet from the Old Testament, and yet Jesus is far, far greater. See, we need to be reading our Old Testament to know what the New Testament tells us. Because actually, I wonder if you notice the crowds that are following Jesus get this. Look at chapter 6, verse 14. In fact, I'll stick it on the screen for you as well. After the people saw the sign Jesus has performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. You see, they get it. They get that Jesus isn't just providing them bread, which is brilliant, and, and fish, which is brilliant. But he is clearly God's promised prophet who has come. See, Jesus is like Elisha, but far, far better. You see, Elisha had 20 small barley loaves and fed 100 people. Well, Jesus has five uh, and two fish and, and feeds possibly up to 20,000 people. Because, because actually, I don't wonder if you noticed, it's 5,000 men, but there's quite likely women and children there too. Jesus is like Elisha, but better. And Jesus is like Moses, but better. See, because when we read the Exodus and the people grumble to Moses that they don't have food to eat, Moses can't do anything. It is the Lord who provides miracle bread from heaven, manna. Uh, and every day for 40 years as they wander in the wilderness, God provides manna from heaven. And each day they gather up just enough for their daily needs. There is no leftovers. In fact, anything leftover just turns to dust, turns to ash if they try to keep it. Uh, and yet here, Jesus provides abundantly more than they need, baskets and baskets of leftovers. The people get it. Jesus is the long-promised prophet. He's the one they've been waiting for. But actually, they don't totally get it, do they? They, they realize, surely this is the prophet who's come into the world. And yet, look at verse 15. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by, forth, with, by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Jesus is the prophet. So we're going to make him king by force. Who cares what he's come to do? We're going to do what we want him to do. They get it to a certain extent, but then they just miss the point totally, don't they? They, they want to do, to a certain extent, the opposite of what Jesus has come to do. 
Um, we're going to uh, turn for a moment back to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Uh, you can turn back or, or you can listen to it, uh, to it. In fact, I think I might have it on, on the screen in a second. There you go. We're going to look, look at Deuteronomy chapter 18, uh, verses, well, 14 to 16. Let me find it for you. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible. I should have put a bookmark in mine, uh, but I didn't, so give me a moment while I flick to the right page. <laughs> Uh, and here in the book of Deuteronomy, it, it is Moses recording all that the Lord has said and, and told him to pass on to the Israelites. Moses is the leader of God's people. Uh, maybe you know the story of the Exodus as they are miraculously rescued from slavery in Egypt uh, and freed so that they can be God's people. Uh, and then they are on the way to the promised land, the land that God has promised them. And while they're on the way, they go to Mount Sinai, and the Lord gives them the Ten Commandments, which almost everybody has heard of, and all more of the law. And the Lord himself, at one point, speaks to the people. And the Israelites are so terrified of the voice of the Lord, of the holiness of God, that they, they plead never, ever, ever to have to face that again. They say they always need a mediator to speak for them, between them and God. And of course, there back, back in Deuteronomy, they've got Moses who does that. And then here is what the Lord says uh, in chapter 18. I'm going to read from verse 14 to 16. The nations you will dispossess, listen to those who practice sorcery and divination. But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb in the day of the assembly, when you said, let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see his great fire any more, or we will die. You see, the Lord God is promising a prophet like Moses. Uh, someone who will always be able to speak to them on behalf of God and speak to God on behalf of them. Uh, and as the storyline of the Bible unfolds, we see lots of prophets who do this. People like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elijah, Elisha, all of the prophets of the Old Testament fulfill this in some way. But we also see a growing expectation that there is a greater prophet to come. A prophet like Moses, but greater than Moses. And you see, as we turn back to John chapter 6, we realise that's who the crowd see that Jesus is. The prophet who they have been waiting for, the great prophet who is to come. Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus is already spotted what it is that the people get wrong. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. Whoops. It not that the opposite of what this crowd is doing? They decide we're going to make him king by force. That's clearly not what Jesus has said and not what Jesus wants. But they take matters into their own hands. They're not listening to him. Oh, I know that Jesus is avoiding confrontation with the religious leaders. I know that he's not going up against the Roman rulers, but that's what we want. So who cares what Jesus says he's about? We're going to force him to be king by force. It's so, well, it's so human, isn't it? Don't, don't we all want to just listen to Jesus to a certain extent, but actually when it really boils down to it, we want him to do what we want, not what he says. How often, if you're a Christian, do you say that you follow Jesus, but when it boils down to it, you don't always listen to him? That, that actually there are things that you almost demand that Jesus does for you rather than that you spend your life submitting and listening to what he says is right and is best. D do we actually listen to where Jesus says that we should invest our money in things of eternal significance instead of temporary joys? 
Do, do we really listen when he says that we should turn the other cheek and forgive and forgive and forgive, not just six or seven times, but 70 times seven, endlessly? If you're a husband, do you really listen when Jesus says that you should love your wife sacrificially, even willing to die for her in the way that Jesus loves the church? Do we really listen when Jesus says that the normal life for the Christian is one of self-denial and, and sacrifice and service, of, of ultimately being like Jesus in terms of carrying our cross, willing to die for him? Do we listen to Jesus? Or are we just like these crowds? He's God's long-promised prophet. Great, let's make him our king to get rid of those Romans. Who cares what he says he's come to do? I follow Jesus. Uh, and so now I expect Jesus to give me the life that I've always wanted, whether it's that wife or that job or that car or that holiday. Oh, now I'm a Christian, Jesus must save all the rest of my family. He must fix my mental health. He must grow the chapel to be known and loved on this estate. See, we might have plenty of good things that we want. And Jesus is kind and gracious and he does give us good things that we ask for. But we've got to be careful not to rush off and demand our own ideas. But instead to listen to Jesus to listen to his plans and his purposes. Because that's the problem that's going on with this crowd. They've seen what Jesus can do and they rush off to their own demands. All oh, right, now we're going to make him king. We can get rid of the Romans. We can do all of that. It's not a bad thing to want Jesus to be their king. In fact, Jesus himself does say he is the king. He is God's long-promised, perfect, forever king. But he's just a king in not the way that they expected. He's not going to be crowned a king by a mob coming and following him into Jerusalem and taking over. He's going to be crowned a king as he dies on a cross as the saviour of the world. You see, Jesus is the prophet who's come into the world. They've got that, but they need to listen to him. Will we listen to him? You see, Jesus hasn't come to take over the religious establishment. He, he hasn't come to, to fight the Romans. He's, he's not interested in chasing after power and influence, is he? Look at, at verse 1 of chapter 6 of John again. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he'd performed by healing those who were ill. Uh, you see, in chapter 5, uh, we see as he teaches that he claims equality with God. Uh, we see him telling people that he is the one who has come bringing judgment on the world. We have seen him saying that he is the only one who can give people eternal life. And because he claims those things, more and more uh, of the Jewish people are, are against him. They, they, they disagree with what he says they don't believe who he claims to be and so they want to fight against him and kill him even while lots of other people turn and start to follow him because of the miracles that he can do but Jesus doesn't want a competition he, he moves away every time there's kind of conflict he goes somewhere else he's not chasing after battles and power and victory and so as he heads across to the other side of this sea, at first with just his closest disciples, the crowds follow him because they are, well, they're desperate for him, aren't they? And Jesus is trying to get away. Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The, the Jewish Passover was near. You see, the, the people are following after Jesus. To a certain extent, not because they actually believe and want to follow him, but because of what they think they can get from him. Jesus is the miracle maker. He's, in their eyes, their own personal miracle vending machine. They've seen the signs that he can do. They've seen him turn water into wine and think, oh, I want some of that. They've seen him heal the sick and think, brilliant, if I stick close to him, I'll always be all right. They just want what they can get from him. Uh, that's understandable, isn't it? Actually, don't we all want that? We want to be healed, to be helped, to be fixed, to be saved. And here is the one person who can give it to them. 
but they're not listening to Jesus. They're not, they're not understanding the bigger picture of what he's come to do. He's not just come to make the life better for a few thousand people in, in a small country in the Middle East for a few years. He's come to be the saviour of the world. It, it's the Passover. Uh, we're given it in this passage lots of little details so that we can know that this really happened. That they've crossed the, the Sea of, of Galilee that, that then becomes a bit later known as the Sea of Tiberias. It's the Passover time They're on the side of a mountain. This is verifiable. Anybody at the time when John first wrote this down could have gone back and spoken to the people and said, oh, I've been told this happened. Did it really happen? And the people would be able to say yes or no. Actually, all those details should give us confidence of the accuracy of what's being recorded. But also it's the time of the Passover, and that brings in, in the Jewish minds a, a real reminder of that great rescue from it, slavery in Egypt, and a great hope that God is going to provide another great rescue for him. And so that's, well, you can see why they might get carried away wanting to make Jesus their king. As the passage goes on, it's not what Jesus is about. And yet he is kind. Look at verse 5. Then Jesus looked up, and saw a great crowd coming towards him. And he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this uh, only to test him, for he already had in mind what, excuse me, what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Uh, another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go amongst so many? Uh, sometimes I think when I read the Gospels, it is a real shame we can't hear the tone of voice because we're kind of imagining it, what, how they might be reacting to this. And in my head, I, I, I feel Philip might be exasperated. Uh, Jesus is sort of saying, well, come on, how are we going to feed all of these people? And he's like, what are you talking about? It's going to take more than half a year's wages and even then you'd only get a tiny bite. Why are you asking me this? And then maybe Andrew comes on a little bit smug. He knows he's not got much to offer, but at least he's coming with some solutions. Look, I've got, I've brought, I've got bread and, and fish from this kid, so look at how great a follower I am. But actually, maybe that says more about me than it does about them. Maybe they did trust Jesus immediately. They, they've seen the miracles that he can do. They've seen him do far greater things than this in some ways. Maybe their answers aren't so much disbelief, which might be where I would end up. But, but they're just stating the truth. Well, it would take more than half a year's wages if we had to buy enough bread, Jesus. But obviously that kind of thing doesn't stop you. Oh, here, here's a boy with, with five small barley loaves and, and two fish. That won't go very far unless you do something miraculous, Jesus. We know this looks impossible, but we've seen Jesus do the impossible without any problem. And of course, we know how the story unfolds. It is no problem for the God of the universe. Jesus said, make the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks and distributed it to those who were seated. As much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. For Jesus, the impossible is possible. There is nothing that is too hard for him to manage. See, back in, in 2 Kings, Elisha was able to feed 100 people with 20 small loaves. That was miraculous. But Jesus can feed thousands with just five. Moses uh, pleads to the Lord and the Lord provides manna from heaven and there is only enough for each day. Here, as Jesus provides, there is an abundance. Fullness and abundance and leftovers more than there was to start with. Jesus provides abundantly. Jesus can do anything. Nothing is impossible for him. When they'd all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, 
gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who'd eaten. Abundance. Blessing. Jesus is like Elisha, but far greater, like Moses, but infinitely better. And the people get it. Surely this is the prophet who's come into the world. But if he really is the prophet, they need to listen to him. We've got to be careful not to just rush ahead with our own ideas of what we want Jesus to do. He is the king. But he's not going to conquer Jerusalem with a mob of 5,000 men and however many women and children behind him. The, the people are so close and yet so far. They keep coming to him on their own terms instead of listening to him. Remember back in verse 2? The great crowd of people followed him. Why? Because they saw the signs he'd performed by healing those who were ill. They just want the miracles. They're not here to listen to him. They're here to get stuff from him. Heal us, feed us, give us stuff. Be our king, but on our terms, not yours. Will we listen to Jesus, the prophet who's come into the world? He is the king, but not crowned by some mob with force, but crowned on a cross through his death with thorns he is the king not just of a small country in the middle east but of all of time and space the king who tells us that the only way into his kingdom is by believing and following him by turning from living for ourselves and putting on tr our trust in jesus alone as our rescuer will you listen to him see we all want what jesus offers but, but too often we want it on our own terms. E even if we're Christians, we can, we can live like that. I, I don't know how many times I have essentially prayed the prayer of, Lord, I will do this if you do this. That is wrong, isn't it? We need to listen to Jesus, to come to him on his terms, not our terms. And thankfully, he is gracious to forgive us when we do come with the wrong motives. But we need to learn to pray the prayer not my will be done, but yours. To, to listen, as he, he taught us in the Lord's Prayer, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in my life, in my heart, in my world, as it is in heaven, your will. It's hard, isn't it? To pray that we would live the way Jesus says instead of our own way. But it is good. It, it is the best way to live. Uh, I hope if you are a Christian that you can say that you have seen that. That you have seen in, in your own life that it is better to listen to Jesus and to do what he says instead of go your own way. That maybe there have been times when you have chosen to sacrifice your own wants to serve other people. And you found a greater joy in doing that. That actually, instead of chasing after that thing that you think will make you happy, actually you've set it aside and said, no, Lord Jesus, I'm going to do what you say is best. And you have experienced that that is better, that there is more joy and a satisfaction and abundance and blessing in living the way Jesus says, in listening to him, than in going your own way. Maybe you've been hurt by others, but instead of seeking revenge, you've offered forgiveness. And found how transformation, how transformative that is. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. And after the people saw the signs Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who's come into the world. Would we realize that that is true? And so would we be people who listen to him? Let me pray. Lord Jesus, you are the prophet who's come. Help us listen to you. You're, you're greater than Moses. You're greater than Elisha. You're greater than anyone else who has ever been. 
You are God's prophet, God's king, God himself. Please show us the places in our lives where we need to listen to you more. Please correct us when we put our own wants and desires first. Please forgive us when we don't listen to you. And Lord, we know that sometimes we do that willfully. Sometimes we do that just obliviousness without realizing it. Sometimes it's when we're, we're hurting so much or we're struggling that we doubt. But Lord, help us to see that listening to you, living your way is the best way, is the right way, brings greater blessing and joy and abundance than, than going our own way. So Lord, show us again that you are worth listening to, that you are worthy. And please help us more and more to pray that prayer. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in our lives as it is perfectly in heaven. Amen. Well, thanks so much, John. Um, we're going to.